here I go, what, it's 10 o'clock? <laughs> so. Well, you're on the opposite end, you know. <laughs> exactly. The earth is a crazy little ball. <laughs> Cool. So we're, we, uh, Hank has started the recording. It is Thursday, October 8th, 2020. This is <clears throat> the Open Global Mind check-in call. Uh, our habit is to go around and, uh, and check in, um, which means what kinds of things are happening in our world that are uh, OGM related, that smell like OGM that we're in. Some of us are hip deep in projects that are very much uh, a part of OGM. Some of us are just here curious uh, and trying to figure out what to do, where to, where to help, uh, et cetera. So these calls are meant to, to help us, um, in some sense, get a sense for who's here, what do we care about, what are we good at, uh, what are we up to. And I typically go from the bottom of my display and grid view in Zoom and work my way <clears throat> back up uh, as a kind of a protocol for going through the check-in. Uh, so right this minute, that would mean Ken, Ken Mark Warren. Warren. And if everybody else can mute your uh, microphones, that will help us. Yeah, can you, can you repeat <clears throat> the order, please? Uh, Ken Mark Lauren, and I'll put it in the chat. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm home again, finally, after uh, being on the road for most of September. Feel a lot yeah. better to be home and be able to go out and, you know, walk around. It's still it's very smoky down here. Um, these fires are still running, you know, uh, pretty much out of control. Um, what a debate last night. I found myself screaming, <laughs> shut the fuck really? up. Really? Shut him up. Shut wow. him up. Shut him up. Um, I just woke up, uh, so I'm really a little discombobulated. So I'm just going to say hello. It's nice to be here. And um, I, I've been trying to keep up the flood of emails going by an awful lot of stuff is happening with OGM that I, I wish I was more cognizant of, but it's just been, um, it's just been too busy to keep up with it all. So thank you for all the work that's going on behind the scenes here. And um, I'm happy to be here and I'll, uh, I'll contribute more later. I hope. Bye. Um, Ken, just so happy to see you back home. Uh, uh, so much to say. Yeah, go ahead. I can, say, I can say one more thing. Yeah. I actually called my Congressman. Um, I spoke to his aide and told them what was going on, what I was seeing behind the scenes at the census. And uh, they said, well, we're not surprised. We're hearing this from a lot of people and there's really not a lot we can do. We've been working with the census and they are not responding at all. The leadership there does not seem to care. Um, so don't expect very much uh, in terms of, you know, which to me was just astonishing that, you know, you, you reveal clear uh, sabotage and, and dirty tricks going on behind the scenes and the con and Congress says, yeah, we know. I'm assuming if Biden wins, there has to be a retake of the census, but that just may be me being naive that that's even possible, but. No, I read an article in the New York Times a few months ago about this, that if, if um, Congress controls both houses and, and, you know, Biden is in there, that they will probably pass a, a special law because it's, it's um, every 10 years it happens as been since 1790, but right. it would, it would be well within their power to say, okay, we know this one is very screwed up. So we're going to redo it um, probably in 2022 or 2023. Yeah. The, the challenge is we're still going to have so many people who do not trust the government. Um, but I think we'll get a much more accurate count. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you for the update. Uh, Mark Lauren Hank. Good morning. Yeah, woke up not so long ago either. I haven't had coffee yet. But it feels like I'm... Oh, can, you cannot hear me? That's so much better, yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, I just, I also woke up not so long ago and not coffee yet, so I don't know if my mind is that clear. Uh, but I didn't watch the, this debate either. I'm not interested. Um... I guess I guess uh, politics has that that's completely turned me off. Um, but I'm more excited to spend my time again, you know, um, um, having this work with indigenous people. Um, so I'm, I'm officially bringing back um, indigenous indigenous voices 
into um, now what um, edition in the fall. So um, I don't know if you guys um, know what it is about, but if not, there is a, a website called now what 2020.com, I believe, um, where you can find out all different sort of programs. So maybe maybe OGM can uh, also do something there. I don't know. There's so many great conversations that we're having here. Um, that's that's it for now. Thank you and good morning. Bonjour. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, hey, Jerry, could you come back to me? There's so much noise here uh, in the background. You bet. Uh, no worries. Uh, so let's do Hank, Rob, and Judy. Yeah, good morning. <clears throat> oh, geez, excuse me. Good morning, everybody. Um, I feel like I just woke up, even though I've been up since like six. So um, that's kind of where I'm at, um, though I have had some coffee. It's just taking a minute to kick in. Um, just got off an interesting call. Yeah, right. Uh, Jerry, just got off an interesting call with some folks here, um, you know, just kind of touching on some of the OGM design stuff. Uh, that's That's been cool. So more to come, I think, on that. Um, you know, just kind of as far as, as personal stuff goes and just kind of things that I've been thinking about, uh, just thinking a lot about just bias in general and how it shows up um, and how it's like created, specifically how it manifests itself like in large organizations um, or slash groups of people, um, you know, and really just kind of like visualizing it, I guess. Um, but like maybe more to come on that, who knows? Um, and I think the other thing is, you know, just sitting back and noticing um, the, and I think I've hit on this before and we all kind of have just, I don't know, man, the lack of discourse that's, that's kind of going on. Uh, how do we, how do we promote it? Um, especially when, you know, sometimes comments are made in a way that don't seem to allow for it. Um, you know, it's like, how do you, how do you respond to somebody when they make a statement in a way that sets you up to, you know, any response that is not, you know, straight up agreement um, is, is considered, you know, complete disagreement or disavowal. Um, you know, how do you, how do you show up in those conversations as a, like a sentient, like <laughs> person who has their own opinions and thoughts that while they might be coming from the same place, you know, kind of might, might manifest themselves a little bit differently. So um, I've been thinking a lot about that. Um, I think we, Maybe that's something that I'll never stop thinking about, <laughs> but, um, but that's kind of where, where my head's been at today. So thanks, Jerry. It's good to see you guys. Sorry, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, thanks, Hank. And mm -hmm. um, I watched the whole debate completely like wrapped last night and got angry on Twitter afterward because a fly landed on Pence's head at some point for two minutes and sat there for two minutes. And the, the Twitterverse went crazy riffing on the fly. And I'm like, this is part of the problem with journalism and everybody else is like, here's a debate where Kamala Harris, six of nine of her answers were body blows and successful and eloquent and beautiful. She kicked his ass up and down the hall. And instead we're sitting here joking that the fly won the debate. And I was just mad, I was just livid. Um, and I just put a funny video uh, on the chat that Mandy Patinkin and his wife did about getting mad over these debates. Uh, just to get out to get people to get out and vote and this whole topic about whether or not we watch and how the debate works is such an OGM topic I mean part of part of what we would like to get to part of one of my wishes about our work together here is that we make civil discourse more possible more frequent uh, and actually a reliable thing uh, that can get us someplace uh, so Rob Judy Neal hey good morning everyone um, from Washington DC I think you all know that I work in the government ecosystem, and uh, so I'll try to bring some snippets of, of that to these calls. Um, I mentioned this in the chat last time, but I had to drop off, but there is an executive order from the president about um, how companies and agencies can give um, training, and it's really horrible and broad and um, encourages people to report their companies. Um, it applies to government agencies. It applies to all government, uh, all companies that receive government contracts, which our company is one, but also all grantees. Um, so grantees would mean really 
universities, medical centers. Um, so it's, it's shocking to me that there hasn't been more visibility um, on, on this topic. So maybe, you know, turn on your radars and, and we'll, uh, we'll, kind of, we'll kind of see that. We um, do a lot of work around the flood insurance program and we're bringing in some, uh, some expertise on design thinking and customer experience. And we had a, <clears throat> a discussion with, with an interesting company and, and about three quarters of the way through, I said, well, <clears throat> one of the requirements would be that you're all US citizens and they were not. <laughs> and so it was like, it just was a reminder of uh, the challenges working in the government uh, environment. They try to make everything fair, but their process of making it fair is to exclude companies because it's, you know, feet long books of, of regulation and things you have to, it, it takes 10 years to figure out what, what is going on. Um, there was uh, nearly a government shutdown last Wednesday night, um, which also got very little coverage. Um, and uh, so just some of those things are kind of front and center in my world. And when I watch the debate and they talk about different levers they're gonna pull and really even the politicians have no idea how Washington operates and so much gets done um, you know, below, below the congressional radar and, and that maybe is an area that needs more focus. On a brighter note, I'm uh, giving a presentation to my company on personal knowledge management today. So um, just kind of a starter, starter jumping off point for some of our new professionals uh, in, and pointing them in the right direction. So I'm excited about that. So that's it for now. That's awesome, Rob. And thank you so much for putting this in front of us. I had just sort of heard whispers in the flood tide on the side about these sorts of things happening and had no direct pointers into it. So your post and Pete's art, uh, NPR article are, are like- Yeah, he's, he's doing a lot of executive orders and they, they are not, they don't go in through any review process. They're just, boom, you, you, you know, unless they get challenged in the courts, which obviously that path has its own challenges now. Um, right. the executive order is basically just law. It's just, it's just this is it. And Trump has spent much of his administration hitting the undo key on everything Obama did. And I have yes. a feeling that we're going to need a sweeping undo key, you know, should Biden win this election. Um, I think we're going to have to do the same sort of thing, which is just really, it whipsaws everybody on the, on, you know, in the country. Correct. Thank you. Um, Judy Neal J. Um, I don't have a lot new to report, except that we've been talking almost every day of the week. And so, um, I've just been trying to keep up. I thought that the session um, with the questions that you had Jerry yesterday were exceptional and the richness of people's response to that Google doc will be very helpful. So I'd encourage any of you who haven't already added your thoughts to do so. Uh, I think we're on the, the crux of perhaps, I hope, really shaping who we, what we believe in, who we are, what we wanna be and how we're gonna do something and I think that's an exciting time for all of us. And meanwhile, I'm sort of scrambling around here. Um, so many people are stressed for so many different reasons that I'm trying to figure out all the time, each time I meet a person online, you know, how do I respond to them with resilience when they're not experiencing any resilience? Because it's almost like you have to do that human interface first in order to be able to even have a discourse of any kind. And I've been spending a lot of time just thinking about that in terms of the state of the world and how do we get collective kindness going at a grassroots level everywhere. That's, I think we just need to all settle down a little bit <laughs> and feel like somebody does care about us. Um, so random acts of kindness persistent random acts of kindness, um, whatever. I'm just thinking about that today. Um, Judy, thank you for mentioning that. Also, um, government benefits ran out for almost everybody by now. No, there's, there's been lockup in Congress about doing any follow-up. Uh, we have an election coming. Trump took negotiations off the table, and then there's going to be an election. Even if Biden wins, there's plenty of conjecture about whether or not 
Trump is going to let go of the reins easily. And so the, the next couple months could be hellish for a lot of people. And I'm wondering what we might do or how this works or what's going to happen. But I think that we're entering, we're entering a, a real kind of spiky, dangerous landscape. Um, and so being kind to people, I think, is extra, extra warranted. So thank you for putting that in front of us that way as well. There's just way too much going on in the world right now. Um, Neil J. Julian. Hi, everybody. Neil from Belgium here. Um, yeah, Belgium and other parts of Europe are about to go into uh, second wave type concerns. You know, uh, ICU uh, started to back up in Brussels, uh, people being redirected to other hospitals. So, you know, not sure exactly the, the full implications yet, but obviously tightening the restrictions. Uh, healthcare systems are, have been pretty resilient up to date, but they're all going, oh God, here we go again. And so uh, it's going to be interesting to see how people cope with this next uh, wave as, as things start to shut down. I think it's dawning on people that um, the challenges are systemic, not just uh, uh, you know, one-off, and that um, these things aren't going to be fixed easily. Um, picking up on Judith's point, I've had many conversations as well, and sensing into uh, the conversations in, with individuals, but also with collectives is so critical to this. And part of the reason I like this group is th this is a secular fellowship group with people of high cognitive capability and maturity, right? Um, but we're also holding a fair bit of heart. And so the some other groups I belong to are much more around collective presence and coming from the spiritual heart-based rather than head-based stuff. And so it's interesting to be sort of playing at these interfaces with head, heart, hands, the doers, the thinkers, the feelers, uh, how do we bring all that stuff uh, together? Um, at the same time, having to play with the dynamics, and I think uh, both Rob and Hank were talking about this, and, and Mark were talking about this, the, the dynamics of uh, groups, group trust, uh, when everybody's under pressure, they can see their, their potential futures diminishing, they can see the threats on the horizon, uh, still experiencing trauma and grief. Uh, there's intergenerational trauma and grief coming through and there's no governance that's actually enabling any pathway out of that yet. So being part of a self-organizing group like this that's really uh, seeking to actively find ways of bringing uh, beauty, goodness, truth, love, you know, compassion, empathy and high cognitive ability into multiple places uh, is... is um, the sort of kick that I need occasionally, especially when other groups uh, get into the stage of sort of competitive uh, feelings of threat. And how do you uh, show up whole if you've been perceived as a threat? Because you're actually operating at a level more than they can yet cope with and you're trying to bring something too soon. And I saw a wonderful statement today, and I'll finish on this, operating at the speed of trust. You know, and how do you bring yourself if you've already brought too much and everybody's goes, oh, it's a bit too scary. And, you know, you find yourself then ostracized by that group. And so it's finding, finding that pathway through that uh, is really interesting for me at the moment. So thank you. Nice to be here. Damn it. I'm forgetting to do the mute. Um, thank you very much, Neil. Uh, J. Julian Bentley. Morning. So uh, back in Ashland, um, another 2,300 mile Bonsai family Kerouacian uh, National Lampoon vacation road trip, um, which was very potent. Uh, it's amazing when you, all you have to do is just get up and drive. It's just something really kind of clean about that. Um, this particular segment, we took a northerly route um, and some of the highlights uh, or deep lights uh, were um, Mount Rushmore, uh, thinking a lot about the uh, Fort Laramie Treaty of 1868 in the Black Hills and just kind of coming into the Black Hills and seeing these profound uh, kind of ancestral mountains. It's just rocks, like you could just feel the, the grandmothers in these rocks and then you kind of span over and then there's this very white face of George Washington there in the place where uh, you know, the treaty had, had been made just decades before and then broken. And being there with the kids was really profound and trying to hold it in a, in a really in a non-judgmental way. Um, not saying like anybody's bad, but just it's like, what, what do you do when you have a clear agreement with an entire nation of people and then it just completely was broken and then you put your 
your face of your of your own grandfathers on the mountain. Um, and then the next piece being like uh, the next day going to Butte, Montana and seeing it in half the mountain actually removed and listening to podcasts about like the, the Berkeley pit and what does it mean when you take all of the copper out of a mountain and leave the toxins behind and still now try to make it, try to fix it through a Superfund site. So this, this kind of the, the overarching theme that I'm, that I'm present with right now is the idea that um, the evolution, uh, we're, we're in a kind of concurrent conflicting evolution that, that somehow we had to get here, that the, the, the course of America was going to come right to this moment that the the conflict of having to leave uh, all of the places, especially England, where to begin this country and come with a certain consciousness, but not one that would actually be able to sustain the land um, for thousands of years as the people who had lived here before were able to do. So the place where I'm landing um, with this after a couple of days of sleep, in addition to when I began my, my conversation with you guys talking about micrology and mythology, the the kind of transformations on the ground and the great transformations um, in the collective. And I'm really, I'm still kind of stretched between both. In my daily work, I do the micrology work. Um, the Just kind of culminating, I'm really landing on like the necessity for reality experiments. Um, I really feel like we need a future and story is is a way to anchor us in a future that's possible. So we can kind of like just carry a glimmer of hope and um so i'm going to be reporting back to um to to you guys on this but uh, it may be a pure sp story experiment but with threads of uh functional supportive reality that help to let us know that that future is possible so that's what i'm playing with that's fabulous jay thank you um and we just um let me see if i can reach it with my Cord here. There we go. Sorry is to the, leave my is butt the in the camera here. Some sort of technical thing. Oh no, sorry. So this is Jay's book, which we just got in the mail very happily. Uh, so congratulations, Jay. Thank you. Thank you so uh, much. It's obviously it. really a hard thing to make anything these days, but thank you so much, Jerry. And uh, Ken's got his copy. It's it's great. This is lovely. Uh, so congratulations. Oh, see it, Ken. Where are you? Yay! Thank you so much. Cool. I'll put a link. I actually had to get it replaced because the first one they sent in, a, in an envelope that was very well padded and the spine was broken. So I had to send it back and get a second copy. But, oh, um, man. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a very cool book. Uh, it's, it's short, but it's, it's got a lot in it. And, uh, you know, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of fun stuff in here. I highly recommend that to people. Cool. You guys are just so cool. I can't get over it. <laughs> so many neat things that you're doing on the side. Um, Julian Bentley, Doug. So uh, good morning from a Palo Alto that's not red. So as uh, I've mentioned before, I'm working on the history of computer graphics. And last week I was able to import the, uh, what they call the art show. This is one of the functions at the annual convention uh, this is going back about 40 years, and I was able to import that into Neo4j. And the, the the good thing about this is that my visualizer using 3D graphics hits Neo4j, so I've been able to run queries between the Art History database and the ACM Digital Library, and put them into the visualizer and look at query results using that. Um, one thing about this visualizer, it also works with the brain files. Uh, so that you can import those databases too, as because they're all knowledge graphs. Uh, this is on my long-term quest to make knowledge something that's manageable and easy to access and manage for people. Uh, so bit by bit, I make this more reliable. There's a major committee meeting on Monday that I'm targeting for because right now my application, my software crashes 50% of well, actually more than more like 75% of the time when you try it. But I expect to have that spiffed up by Monday. That sounds awesome, Julian. If you have a URL for the project and you can share that with us, that'd be great. I mean, it may not be at that stage, but uh, that would be really fun to see. Um, and it might also be useful for the Free Jerry's Brain project. That would be um, really interesting. What's yeah, I did uh, try to import your brain once, but the uh, it's too big. 
What was the art history? That. That's a quote for me is your brain is too big. <laughs> I love that. Sorry, Rob, go ahead. What's the art history database you referenced, Julian? Uh, so this is the SIGGRAPH, ACM SIGGRAPH art, uh, the art show component of the annual com conference. Okay, I thought you referenced a separate one that was art history. Uh, yeah, because it's considered art history as opposed to art. Okay. So. Cool. Um, cool. We have, oops, sorry, I lost my uh, Bentley, Doug, uh, and then Pete. Hey, everybody. Um, I have been out of these calls for a while. I've been moving and several other things. Um, lots, too much exciting stuff. I think I said this last time I was here. Uh, I'm still participating in the Free Jerry's Brain call, trying to free his brain, uh, his too big brain. Um, and uh, and I'm interested in, uh, I like Julian's work also. We might need to figure out a way that it could pull in and display a partial set. So maybe we should discuss that sometime. Um, yeah, uh, so I, yeah, I'm, I'll discombobulate. So I will probably have to drop off this call. I will be lurking um, and then just throwing grenades over the wall every once in a while. And then I'll participate a little bit deeper when I can but I love hearing all the stuff. Thank you, Bentley. And glad your move is, is, sounds like it's going smoothly. So that's good. I got my lights up so you can see me this time. Exactly, that's <laughs> full lighting, it's great. A well-lit discombobulated lurking grenade thrower. I'm a bit worried about this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At least you can see it coming. Um, Doug, Pete, Ingrid. Well, I'm uh, working on the final draft of this book I've been working on called Garden World Politics. And the view is that if we don't have an image of the future, it's very hard to work towards it. Uh, whatever kind of restorative work we're doing, if it has a vector that's clear to us towards the future, I think it clarifies a lot of what the efforts are and what the discussions need to be about. I've been working lately on the idea that, that things will unfold without a terminal point. It's, there's a goal of a garden world as the way of integrating the need for food and the need for habitat in an attractive kind of Chris Alexandrian sort of way. But then we go through that towards uh, thinking about rebuilding the whole civilization. And I've realized that the idea of civilization is very controversial because it implies hierarchy and power. And, but if we don't do that, what's the alternative? So that's where I'm thinking right now. Which of course takes us to the question posed to Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? To which his answer was, that would be a great idea. Um, or something, I'm paraphrasing poorly, but basically it'd be great if, if we had one. Uh, so now so many things have gone through the chat that I've lost my, 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 uh, my cue. Pete Ingrid Scott. Uh, good morning, all. Um, uh, I wish I had a more concise way to put it. I've been thinking mostly about uh, tools for uh, groups like this, um, different kinds of tools and how we might use them and how we might use them better. Uh, I, don't have, I don't have anything more crisp than that yet. So uh, maybe that's good for me today. Awesome. And I've bumped into a fellow who's got a project titled As We May Think, which is inspired by, as you might imagine, Vannevar Bush's As We May Think paper and so forth, and uh, will hopefully be in our conversation at some point soon. Uh, Ingrid Scott Klaus. Ingrid, welcome. Hey guys. Um, yeah, I'm new to this and uh, came in by the Flux Mindset Group and have been watching your conversations unfold over email. And then I saw your Google Doc and then Usually I, I'm, I'm in Amsterdam, so this is not, not a great time for me. So I couldn't join, but I was really intrigued by the last, the Google Doc and this whole plan. Um, pretty, pretty interesting stuff. And I guess uh, if, I could, if I could say anything, um, I've been thinking a lot lately about this giant uh, transformational shift to isolation for a lot of people for months and months now. Um, and what it's doing to us that we haven't even considered yet, um, good and bad. So um, I'm, I'm really curious about um, what's happening with people and finding a way to sort of communicate um, 
you know, find community within that isolation, I guess, because this is not going away. And we've already made a weird shift into something else, even if things come completely back to normal, which is not going to happen, we all know, right? Um, so yeah, but anyway, thanks for uh, having me on. It's, oh, it's very interesting. <laughs> so happy you're here. Thanks, Ingrid. This is, this is terrific. Um, and for me, like <clears throat> my sport, my sport is Aikido, which is a full contact martial art and you're breathing in somebody's face. That ain't going to be happening for a while. So what we're doing is we're training in a park with the Joe, which is a stick and we're learning that separately, standing separate from each other. And it's heartbreaking because it's such a fun sport. And then I occasionally hold retreats and some of the people on this call have been to many of my retreats. And first thing I do when people show up at their sheets, we all, we hug and it's like, I don't, I, it's like, when is that going to happen again? My heart is just so, so hurting for, for that to come back. Um, so thanks for, for reminding us of, to pay attention to those effects. Neil, you want to jump in? Quick one. Um, we've mentioned a bit about the trauma. We've mentioned a bit about the losses. We've mentioned a bit about grieving for those things we can't do. And there's an evolutionary window here. Doug was talking about it in terms of um, you know, finding a vector for the future. Some of the futures we're imagining are impossible. They are no longer possible. And the sooner we realize that, the sooner we can redirect energies towards things which might be possible. And so this is part of the facing reality challenge that we've all got. Now, how do we heal from the past and stop pursuing impossible dreams in systems context and redirect energies? And I just wanted to share that because people are starting to, it's dawning on people and they don't have the tools to cope with it yet. And they're gonna be critically needed. Thanks. And I'll just uh, riff on one thing you said here uh, about how do we, um, can't type and talk at the same time, how do, how do we redirect energies? And I, I, long ago I heard about Milton Erickson, a uh, psychotherapist and hypnotist. He used to use hypnotism to fix, to help people talk to their, he, he was trying to open a new conversation with their unconscious. And he would do very tiny things sometimes that would cause large changes in behavior to the patient. Um, by giving them a better repertory of, thing, of, of options to choose from when they approach the bridge because they had a phobia about crossing bridges, for example. And I've, I've always been trying to figure out what is Wu Wei, what is the action through least action that will in fact tip us towards suddenly seeing each other again as humans who are sharing a planet. And, and there's like, there's hundreds of movements out there trying to do this in every way they know how. Uh, and it hasn't worked because we're, our brains are still eaten with consumer mass market capitalism and neoliberalism and God knows what other kinds of scripts that are in our heads. So I keep looking for what are the simple, subtle things that will carry and tip and catalyze and whatever metaphor you want to use us into suddenly a different way of being with each other, seeing each other, being with each other and doing things uh, with each other. Um, that would be lovely uh, to do. And I, I actually own the domain CBDo. Uh, which I was developing with Marty Spiegelman, who is a shaman, and we never, we never actually finished the, the workshop or started hosting the workshop we built around that idea. Uh, so uh, Jay asks, which is, what is which project called? Which project do you mean, Jay? What did I say that sounded project-like? However you call this uh, subtle peacemaking uh, reality transformation project. I, it's in my head. It's not, it doesn't really have a tangible uh, project name, uh, but we could pick up CBDo and go with that, for example. But, but I, th I think that this is like, uh, maybe I'm describing something that a bunch of us have, have sort of th seen or are thinking about. I don't, is that what, what it feels like? I don't know. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I was going to say that it's at least uh, seven of us are talking about the exact same thing from different angles. Um, probably more of us thinking about it. I just would love to you know, whether it's the radical kindness or subtle changes, just like something we can anchor to and make a breakout, whatever that looks like, I'm down. Okay, uh, me too. And that, I, I really like that. Thank you. Um, cool. So we've got, uh, again, I've got to scroll back up. Scott, Klaus, Lauren, then Matt. Hey, everyone. Um, a couple of things. The one that's most on point with where we are right at the moment is I had another call with Lauren and Charles earlier in the week and an idea, I proposed, proposed an idea that just top of the head and, and they both jumped on it. And so I thought I'd share it with you. So the idea is about conflict in a meeting, something that they were dealing with. And the, the idea I had was if a conflict appears, the group gets to vote, you know, as simple as that. Do we continue the debate? Do we let these two people fight it out because we like we see something happening here that we want to have continue. Or 
we, we say, no, this is not going to happen in this space at this time. And we, we, stop, the, we stop the argument, if you will. The reason I say that is that I saw a debate, formal debate in an auditorium, two people, and when they got to the Q&A section, they asked the audience, this is normally where we break for half an hour, do the Q&A, and do you want us to keep going or do you want us to do the Q&A? And they responded with applause saying, we want the debate to continue. And so it, it was a way of sort of reading the room and saying, okay, are you more interested in seeing how this plays out or are you all feeling uncomfortable and thinking this argument doesn't belong here? And it was just a way of kind of interrupting that. And so I thought I'd share that with you. Um, second thing was that Neil challenged me in, in a, another meeting earlier this week, I think it was. And it's got me really thinking about the thing that I've been talking about so much, which is taking these ideas and taking them to, to kids or to people who are less uh, plugged into the things that we're doing on it right now. And he was challenging us to say, well, we need, in 10 years, there might not be the, the coastlines that we need. We might not have the environment that we need if we just say, we're going to, I'm going to teach the kids because by the time they get there, maybe it's, it's too late. And I, I realize this is why I think, Neil, you were challenging me and I appreciate that, that it feels like a subtle way of hiding for myself. Because if I just, if I just teach the kids, then it's their problem to solve. And that, it, it, I, I appreciate you kind of calling me on that. I still might do that, but at least I know what I'm doing. Um, so that's it for me. Tom, thank you. That's really, that's really nice. Thanks, Scott. Can, um, I, can I just respond just briefly? Thank, thanks very much for that, mate. And um, the challenge we've got is we have to teach the kids and we have to teach the adults. Um, the kids are smart enough to do it if the, if the adults that are currently preventing it get out of the way. But if they're in the way until the kids get to the point of employment, it's too late because you know, those jobs won't exist, those coastlines won't exist, those environments won't exist. So thanks for that. Um, one interesting thing is that kids are often a really good vector to get to the adults. Um, in the city of Curitiba in the 70s, the mayor Jaime Lerner did a bunch of really transformative things that were super cool. And one of the things they did was they made Curitiba the greenest city in South America by teaching the kids about uh, recycling and having them teach their adults and straighten out their households. Uh, then I think in Guatemala or Honduras, I'm forgetting where, they achieved literacy, adult, uh, they, they like boosted adult literacy by 20% by basically having the kid, they stopped school for two weeks. They said, everybody go home, find adults who, are, who can't read and teach them to read. And like, like just, just mm. stopping everything and having young people teach older people to read for two weeks, boosted literacy, and I'm, I'm probably exaggerating the story, but, and I'm forgetting which country, but, but the kids are often a vector to helping um, adults go ahead. Mark, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, some, some of you might have wondered, I don't know, um, what that picture was, and, and that's my son, um, when was that, eight years ago? He asked me uh, about a week or two before Father's Day, hey, Papa, what do you want to do for Father's Day? Uh, put some thought into that. And I said, hey, you know, there is that cove up north that we visited once. Let's go back. And what we did, we cleaned it. So that's him with a bag of, you know, litter. And then we, right by uh, where I live on, on the top, uh, there are, you know, several parks. So we adopted uh, a grove and we cleaned it too. We removed about uh, five bags of five gallon liters over the course of almost a year. And it changed completely the place, the energy. And, and since then I find, you know, my son, my son is just that. So he has to, you know, educating the kids, bringing them outside and, and teaching them that way. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. That's, that's lovely. Um, Klaus, Lauren, Matt. Uh, Scott, before that, Scott. Yeah, I just have one quick thing that I forgot to mention. <clears throat> the other thing I was working on, Doug, thank you for recommending Bruno Latour. Um, I am not quite advanced enough to understand everything that he's saying, but 
I did, I'm pasting a, a, a video in the chat, it's like 45 minutes or so, that I was able to, to capture. And that idea of having that vector that you're heading towards, I think the way he conceptualized it is we, we have created this path where you're either going forward or backward. And he said, there's a third attractor. And that, so progress is not a fight between is this progress or this progress, going forwards or going back. It's actually progress is towards this third place and going backwards regression is actually going back to the, the other places. And he draws it up on the whiteboard and he's, he's wonderful to listen to, but thank you for that, Doug. I think this is, this is a terrific little video. <laughs> Super cool. Thank you, Scott. Um, Klaus, Lauren, Matt. Yeah, good morning. Yesterday was, uh, was an interesting day. It started out really good and ended up with my wife throwing objects at the television set, uh, listening to the debate. Um, <clears throat> but I, I started out with a conversation with the founders, co-founders of uh, Kiss the Crown. And I, I don't know if you have seen the film or heard about it. I'm gonna put it into the, into the chat here. Um, Kiss the Ground is an organization really well funded uh, um, through uh, grants, um, um, private money, uh, focused completely on soil restoration and regenerative organic agriculture. So they created this film that they have been working on for like seven years, and it's just wonderful. I mean, it's an amazing uh, documentation how um, we have the capacity to restore soil and thereby solve uh, so many climate change related issues. Um, so we decided, we, um, we decided uh, and, and formed already a team with the Sierra Club um, where we will show this film for one week to the 3.8 million members and then finish that with a panel discussion on what can you do about this? What does this mean to you as a consumer and how can you engage in your community to fast to 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 accelerate uh, the conversion of uh, of uh, farming into a regenerative process, um, and I jumped for, off that call to the Natural Products Expo, and and two observations there. One was the software was fascinating. I mean the the way they uh, uh, the the way the software is structured, you can literally go into an expo room and look at products. And you can visit individual booths and when you enter, you know, there's a salesperson that will connect you. You can see the products, you can order samples. You know? um, I mean, fascinating. And uh, the expo started out with a, uh, a keynote presentation and I actually copied the speaker notes uh, yesterday to the OGM uh, uh, chat. And I was just blown away how, um, how the speaker had summarized the key issues that we have with our food system from a consumer's perspective. So, so here, these are now the products that we need to focus on to build our own immune system. You know, and this is this uh, immunocompromised buzzword that's starting to float. And this, this entire conference was totally keyed in to that particular concept. You know? So, I can see a convergence and in, in inflection points uh, uh, in the agricultural sector where consumers are becoming dialed in and aware you know, of uh, what does my personal buying behavior uh, do to, uh, to this entire process there. And the industry is, is, uh, is really beginning to understand this is, this is shifting and we need to flow with it. So that was, that was uh, uh, very encouraging. I mean, I really felt uh, um, moved yesterday in, in, in how many people are jumping in. We have a couple of teams now at Citizen Climate Lobby working on presentations to the farming community, you know, to talk with farmers about climate change. Um, so it's moving, it's happening. Klaus, thank you. And, and I'll just, a side note, sort of historic side note for me, my last 25, 30 years journey to where I am on trust and other issues started from the word consumer. And I think that part of our problem is we're thinking about and calling those people consumers instead of citizens or instead of people. And that when they're mere consumers, their only job is to go buy stuff that's wrapped in styrofoam in the store. <clears throat> when, when we think of them differently, their job is to co-produce, to be, be more mindful about it, to steward the soil, to do all the different kinds of things you're talking about. 
Um, so, so I think there's an interesting vocabulary issue that's eaten our brains as well in the middle of all that. Um, Lauren and then Matt. Hey everybody. Um, first, I want to say that the um, Matt and uh, Hank and the planners of the um, uh, of the upcoming OGM session, uh, yeah, the workshop. Uh, we would love to. We would love to help you in any way we can and to join that. So, um, yeah, you can have a lot of help with that if you want it. <laughs> And uh, great, great. We're really into that. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's really exciting. The, the little session yesterday was really exciting, kind of trying to get a vision for uh, OGM. And um, we just had so many exciting possibilities. And I, I, I think I've said this before, before, but I'll say it again. I think that it could be um, uh, something that spans across uh, several organizational kinds of entities and maybe it can have like a nonprofit side and a for-profit side and um, uh, and uh, Charles and I did plan to lead uh, you know towards the end of this month maybe more realistically in November kind of a community-wide um, kind of hoedown uh, grant hoedown to search for possible funding uh, mechanisms and to coordinate our effort to do those. Uh, and I uh, just wanted to mention on October 19th and on our Monday session, we're going to have um, uh, Howard uh, Rheingold uh, maybe talk about crap detection and also so Judy's friend Kyle. So that should be fun. <laughs> That sounds great. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. And I think you're going to put that invite on the OGM list, right? Yeah. Cool. Um, and I haven't caught up on this morning's email, so you might already have done that. Uh, Matt, over to you in the booth. All right. Hello, everybody. Um, good morning. Good evening. Um, it's great to see everyone. Um, Maybe before I talk about where where some of the planning is for this alignment session, there's a couple of things on my mind. The first is uh, we had our kind of our first uh, uh, exposure at my daughter's school to COVID, um, so um, it's coming. Um, uh, there's a you know group of kids, not my daughter, but a group of kids that are on lockdown. So they basically said everyone who was in that same you know, group has to be quarantined for 14 days um, before coming back to school, um, regardless of whether they get tested or not. So that's going to be interesting to see how this plays out with um, the opening and closing of um, almost like a sub where you shut different compartments um, and, uh, you know, contain things. Um, the second thing is I have uh, finished reading and rereading um, Down to Earth uh, by Latour. Um, and happy to uh, you know spend time talking about it. Um, there's some sections that I really need um, um, you know to process with some other people, but I do think it's it's fascinating. And Doug, I'm I'm very interested to hear um, and to read your work um, and how you're thinking. I completely agree that um, part of the problem that we're dealing with now is that we can speak about the problems, but what we can't do is we can't pay, paint a big enough picture. Uh, to feel safe like a hermit crab to leave our shell and move into some other shell. And so until we have um, that vision that is, um, is a better reality for, for people, people are going to hold on to, you know, the homes that they have and the money that they have and all of those things. And so I think part of change is painting that, that future picture. Um, so um, the, um, the other thing is I'm working on a project right now uh, this is with all of the CFOs of a major um, financial services company. And we're talking about, um, they invited me in to talk about how they can better influence change in their organization and what are the skills around influence. And everything that I've been, um, you know, reading and coming up with as I search for uh, that word in particular <laughs> are things like, you know, Marcus Cirillo and how to win an argument and, you know, how to, you know, influence people and 
friends and, and, and they're all, it's all really, to me, it's, um, it's manipulative stuff. Um, and so this program is really about helping them understand that influence comes through helping see people see differently, think differently, and therefore act differently. And I'd love if anyone has, um, sorry for the, uh, the noise of the construction, you can actually see someone right out my window fixing are they, my roof. Are they trying to break down your door and is this like a police yeah. invasion? Yeah, they're, um, they're, cool. they're repairing the roof back there, but it's it looks, right looks, on looks like a looks like a well-lit uh, lurking grenade thrower to me. Yeah, exactly, uh, exactly. Um, uh, but, uh, if anyone has anything that on influence and on how influence works in more of a uh, facilitative way, I'd love to. I'd love to read anything and to catch up on stuff. I'm I'm building some curriculum now and feel pretty happy with it, but always interested in new things. Um, so with that, um, as Lauren mentioned at uh, at the end of last week's um, adventure. Um, you know, my sense is that um, we're ready. We're ready as a group to take the next step of putting some definition around this. And Judith, I know you've mentioned this a couple of different times around how do we get aligned on who we are, um, what we want to be, um, what we're going to do, um, where we want to go. And I know yesterday's conversation was um, a really positive start, but I want to um, we're trying to create a, a program. I, we have a loose structure for what that's going to look like. Um, I know Charles reached out and Lauren, maybe we can grab a quick call to take you guys through it, but um, we'd like to invite everyone to participate. Um, I do think it's going to take a kind of a, a, a body of time, but the goal is for us to walk out of there feeling more aligned around um, where this thing is going. And um, Ingrid, I know you're first, you're, you're new to this call. Um, but um, uh, really appreciate um, the diversity of voices. And um, I think I wanted to spell the myth around mm. the fact that um, mm. we don't have the answers yet. We have ideas and now it's mm. time to start to shape those into maybe some uh, lines of thought and some trajectories. And so that's the objective of this, um, of the session that we'll have. And there'll be a little bit of work beforehand, but um, want to just encourage anyone who wants to see this project take the next step to be a part of that and and we'll we'll talk about it more next uh next thursday uh in terms of what the work is and stuff and i think jerry's going to communicate with everyone um about uh, you know are you in i think what it means to be in is next week we'll launch an individual assignment for everyone to give people an opportunity to um, put down their own thoughts about what they think ogm should look like um, we want to do this at an individual level because that's one of the ways to preserve the diversity versus the loudest voices. Um, then um, the week after that, we're looking to do a opportunity for people to share their perspectives with each other in small teams, just to listen to those perspectives. Um, there'll be a week, uh, hopefully a week's time after that for people to reflect on, um, to reflect on what they heard. And then when we get together, um, and I think we're targeting Thursday the 29th. Um, we can maybe move that, but I'd prefer to get it in before the election so that we can um, you know, not be consumed by um, post-election um, craziness. Um, on the 29th, um, we're looking to spend about five hours where we integrate, um, each team will integrate their perspectives into a shared view. Um, uh, we'll report those things out and then we'll synthesize the material into um, again a set of trajectories that um, that we can um, we can start to build some momentum around. In addition to continuing this check-in, so uh, that's the plan. Um, we'll have more documented um, by next week for the kickoff. But um, Jerry is going to ask if uh, you want to be a participant and if you can commit the time because um, you know it is a it is a it's a time consuming um, process, but I think that's what's gonna re be required to get us um, aligned to, to kind of get over this threshold moment that we're in right now. So let me stop there. Cool, thank you. Um, Phelan, welcome to the call. We just finished our round of check-ins and you just jumped in, so it's not quite fair to, to leap to you to check in, but if you'd like to, you're welcome to. Um, um, no, just listen to whatever else I can listen to. Sounds great. 
Um, so let me just pause and see what, uh, where we would like to take the conversation right this second. I shared the, the Google Doc we're talking about was a working document from yesterday's OGM call about starting the conversation about why are we here, what are we actually doing together. Um, so that's further up in the, in, the, uh, in the chat and we can post it again. Uh, but what, uh, where should we go with the conversation right now? I just want to see what, we put a whole bunch of interesting things on the table in the check-in. Well, I'm going to jump in here. I have a feeling that it's very hard to be thinking about the future right now because we are looking at it as something we can do to add to the current situation and make it better. But I think we're in a period of punctuated equilibrium where all efforts are plural and there's so much going on and we have no idea what's going to succeed coming out of it. So it's very hard to figure out what to do to restore or repair what we have when we're going to go through a period of entropy where everything seems to be falling apart. And then the question is, how do we conduct ourselves through that period? And I'm, I'm doing a sort of agree because I totally agree that we're in a period of punctuated equilibrium. I'm not sure that I feel... I, I, an uncertainty about where to lean or what to do. Not that there's any guarantee of that what we do is good. I think that what we're doing right here is like top dead, like right on target for a good thing we, we might do uh, to get this done. So, so what's, what's cool about the moment is that we're in this weird liminal transitional melty moment where a lot of institutions are cracking a lot of, which has the terrible side effects that a whole bunch of, of, of groups and people are suffering uh, and, and the, the nets that are usually trying to be there to catch them are being broken intentionally, et cetera. So that, that's, that's miserable. Uh, but what it does is it sort of opens us up and softens us up to actually maybe help and step in. And it feels also like um, positive behaviors that are repeated and grooved right now will be durable through the punctuated equilibrium moment and may actually pick up and, and frame the way we are with each other later. Um, and unfortunately, the whole situation could go to hell in a handbasket and we could end up in some kind of, you know, Dante issuing of hell <clears throat> together, in which case we will be happy to have formed some communities that we trust because we, that will make living in whatever ring of hell we end up in a lot more bearable, I think. Anyway, that, that's, that's my own take on it is that, is that yes, the situation, but I don't, I don't feel at a complete loss for what to do about it. I feel like I feel like the conversation we're holding here is important for what to do about it. Does that make sense, Doug? But there, there was another point that Doug said is is um, is the how how are we going to do it, and that and that's to me as even more uh, it's even more important than the what, because we lead by example. You know, uh, going back to the story with my son, the the, the core teaching was reciprocity. You come to a place, you enjoy the place. So you do something for the place that you're in or the space. So cleaning it, even though, you know, the trash is coming from somebody else, is part of that reciprocal relationship that you have with the place. Love that. And that implies a particular point of view or frame of mind with what place even means. And how do we get, how do, how do we get there? Klaus and Ken? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think we, we are in a period that may get a lot worse where people are basically worried about food and shelter, just the basics. You know, the, 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 I think the number is something like 40 million people are at the uh, risk of eviction by the end of December when I mean, this moratorium runs out. Um, and this number is probably going to call. And food insecurity is a real thing. So. Um, my, my, my take has been that there is really nothing to be invented. Everything is already out there somewhere. You know, there, there are so many uh, uh, best case examples of what you can do to protect your community, to find, to find community, join community, and so on. Um, I, I think just gathering this up and making it accessible and helping people with information because the market is starved of information. 
Now, and the, the, unfortunately, our government is dysfunctional. And normally where the gov where government agencies, you know, like the uh, USDA and you know, the farm uh, 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 housing and everyone where, where they would lead the initiative to help people, they're dysfunctional. Uh, so how, how, does, uh, how, how can we gather information and make information available and, and, and bridge people who can help each other and don't know about each other? Thanks, Klaus. And I just, I just posted something that's a little bit cynical in the chat, which is that um, if, you, if you think that Trump and his government are out to actually shatter the system and that that's part of what they were hired to do, they're actually doing a really good job on it. I would score, the, the reason I think Trump's base doesn't shrink below like 35% um, is that he is actually scoring like an A on destroying norms, destroying the system, dismantling the government, uh, shattering the world agreements, all that kind of stuff. He's like really performing on that. Uh, and that is horrifying, I think, to a lot of us. Um, and and I, I have this weird moment where I, what, what I just said about we're in a liminal space, like when I voted for Hillary, I voted, I was voting for the first woman to be president of the United States, but I was setting aside mentally, unconsciously, all my plans to redesign the world from trust and to do this and to do that. I was like setting those aside because I knew that Hillary was going to be a steward of the status quo. And, and I think what's broken right now is the status quo. And what scares me about Biden is that he might be a great steward of the status quo and sort of bring us back to where we were. And I'm really interested in us going somewhere different from where we were. Really interested. And the fact that things have been smashed and dissolved and shattered and shaken is beneficial in a transition to a better way of being together to solve the different kinds of problems that we face. Ken. A couple of things come up for me. Um, one, Michael Mead is someone who I've spent a lot of time reading and studying. He's a mythologist and storyteller and former leader in the men's movement. And um, Michael talks about the fact that the world does not end. Um, there have been many movements in history. So it's the end of the world, the end of the world, the end of the world. The world continues. It might be the end of our world. We may be looking, we may be right on the precipice of the end of the world that we have known and grown up in is definitely going through major transformation. But uh, unless we really bring about an amazingly cataclysmic event, there will still be people for a very long time. They may not have the kind of quality of life and the kind of quality of environment that we've had in order to have the kind of uh, decent life that we've got. But there are going to be people here. And I think that's really important to remember that there will still be people um, so that's kind of my baseline for starting. And then um, I can't remember when, when was the mission accomplished thing where Bush landed on the aircraft carrier and said, you that know, we've was, won uh, the like war. That was like hundred days into the Iraq war. Somewhere, yeah, okay. somewhere there, somewhere there. 2003. Okay. So in yeah. 2003, uh, thank you. Ming. In 2003, a, a woman invited me to bring together, she wanted me to, to facilitate a, a world cafe for um, business people and um peace activists. And I didn't want to do it. I said, I don't want to do it. She said, why not? I said, because peace activists are the most violent people I know. They're out there going, no blood for oil, no blood for oil. I mean, they're really like harsh in their stance about what peace means. And um, she finally convinced me. And, and so I got there and I said, you know, this is Jennifer. She's our graphic recorder. She's going to capture what comes out of today in terms of, of output. And immediately somebody goes, capture is war language. You can't use war language in this room. And this is actually at the foundation for global community, which had previously been beyond war. So that's where the, this was taking place. And I was like, this is why I didn't want to do this project, right? And um, I said, okay, well, you know, what would you have us use? So that was a minor issue. But the way that I got around things was I had people sit at tables of four and I said, okay, so we're here to talk about peace. And I'd like you to tell the story of the first time that you can remember that peace was going to be important in your life. When did you wake up to the fact that peace was something that was meaningful? Two rounds of that. And within, within a, an hour of people sharing their stories, and most people went back to a time when they were very idealistic as a young uh, teenager, maybe 10, 12, 14, somewhere in there. Um, everybody had moved from being a business person or a peace activist to being a person interested in peace. So I think the way that we facilitate, the way that we frame questions is extremely important. Where we point a group's attention, we can point it, the way that, that politics works is to point your attention to what doesn't work and then divide people by talking about the other side can't fix it, we can fix it, and then they just start slinging about it. 
If instead they said, what's important? What do you guys really want to have happen here? What's the function of government? You know, why is it important to have um, people coming in and, and taking care of things who, you know, we're collecting all this money from taxes that gets dispersed, really important things for us to spend it on. If we could get that conversation going on, we would have really different types of relationships. I think of Joan Blades after she, she got done with Move On, founded Living Room Conversations. That's brought together people on the right and the left and by asking questions that aren't divisive but are more about what do you care about and why do you care about them, people from opposite sides of, of ideologies are saying we actually have a lot more in common than we have dividing us. And now we see that the system as currently constructed is actually working against everybody's common interests. So there are examples of, of this working out there. And I think it's just a really important framing. And the last point I wanna make is, I have this little allergic, allergic reaction to the question of how do we do something? Because I think how do we do something puts us into a problem solution engineering mindset and it closes off imagination. So rather than ask how do we do, I like to, to um, pose the question of what would it look like if? So what would it look like if open global mind were successful? What would it look like if we had a, a culture that was building towards a desirable future? Um, it takes us out of the, oh, we have to figure something out into let's imagine it together, you know, and that just creates a, a much more broadened playing field. So that's my, um, that's my, my riff, riff for the day. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Ken, very much. <clears throat> uh, Jay. So some of the conversations that um, have been coming up for me lately, and I've been observing a lot of people uh, kind of leaving California leaving Oregon, um, you know, saying the fires are too much, we need to go find a different place. And, uh, you know, the question I keep coming back to is not, it's not as much about uh, where do we live as it is about how do we live. And I just keep anchoring that and it's, and it's not an easy thing to kind of reframe, especially when you're dealing with trauma and uh, realities of, you know, family and everything. But um, on our trip across and back across the country, we, we stayed at this, uh, there's this new app called Hip Camp, which I might have mentioned on the way out. And um, the, the reason I bring this up is because it's basically a relationship of trust. It's Airbnb without, um, without the structure. So you can just go to a place where you, you can lay down your tent. You don't have to talk to anybody or see anybody. It all happens on the app. Very COVID appropriate. Um, I... I believe that there's, as we're asking this question, not just where are we gonna live, but how are we gonna live? And there are gonna be, there's gonna be a lot, a lot of people, especially a lot of young people or youngish 30s, 40s um, uprooting. There is a big opportunity to say, okay, well, what is that elevated network of places? What does it look like? What might it look like? Go out into the future and say, what could, what could bi-nomadic living actually look like? Because we're, I mean, I'm kind of tended to that anyway. Uh, being in a, in a place consistently for a long time is a pretty new thing for me. Um, so, but what is the real stable and real vibrant way of doing that, which might mean staying in one place for six months, eight months, may mean smoke's here, we're gonna go to the desert, et cetera. So I just wanted to bring that into the conversation. Um, thanks, Jay. And, I, and every now and then I wind up pondering about nomadic peoples and, and how this works because <clears throat> a lot of folks in the Americas before the Europeans get here move around a bunch and we tend to sort of map territories and they sort of and uh, April and I were in Mongolia a couple of years ago and the the Mongolians on the steppe who were mostly herders they move three times a year they have they have sort of three the, the reason they have gurs that are really easy to pack up is that you know they can break down a girl in a couple hours, load it up, and just truck on off. And when they move to winter quarters, tucked up into the hills more, they leave behind the cows and the horses. I think I'm not sure. Cows and horses can kind of take care of themselves, but they leave them behind, and they take the sheep and the goats and the camels with them, something like that. And that there's a whole bunch of rhythms established, and and that the the, the the attitudes toward place and and so forth are really interesting. Um, another tiny thing. Uh, there's no fences out there. You just go sort of graze your animals in different places. And at one point, um, uh, and, and the way you get the cows to come back home is you sort of rope up a calf from one of the lead cows back at camp. And so that cow wants to come back to her calf uh, later in the day. Uh, and uh, at one point we were sitting there and 
uh, the, our host's cows had come back and then another bunch of cows just comes from over there, walks through our, our camp and walks over there to, to their camp with nobody leading them. They just sort of go back. And I'm like, this thing is on autopilot by people who seem to understand a lot about the land and the critters and everything else. I like how this works. And then we've managed to sort of plant down and, and, and put fences around everything and, and use ownership to say, this is mine, not yours. And then we've started doing those things way too close to forests and in the middle of places that burn without having taken care of the landscape. So we're, it's really, really messy everywhere um, as we sort of walk through and do this. But, but what does a modern nomadic lifestyle look like where we're rooted in place somehow, somewhere, which might be multiple place, but where we're rooted in community in places like this, <clears throat> right? Where we know people who do and show up and, and share and, and help build a uh, meal. Uh, sorry to dash your hopes, guys. 7.8 billion people nomadically roaming the planet looking for better places as climate collapse, ecological collapse, sea level rise, uh, political collapse, geopolitical collapse happens, isn't going to happen. Um, so I feel for you. I can't see all your faces at the moment because I'm looking at a diagram which I posted in the, um, uh, the OGM uh, Google Doc that was posted earlier in this in this. Uh, point. I love the idea about how do we live. Uh, I'm coming back to Doug's point about you know place-based connection. So we need to work with the places we have. Uh, people are still looking for the best place to be, but geopolitics, migration, everything else is going to screw that up. So we need, I believe this is the people-centric approach. Uh, and from my diagram, empowered individuals collaborating in intergenerational communities of healing, co-design and development. And they have to somehow mutually create exemplar cohesive communities of need and communities of care operating within better understood changing linked social ecological system limits right these are going to be islands of sanity not everybody's going to make it through this evolutionary bottleneck the question is how many can get through right and if so how many models have we got that are tailored for places and anticipatorily designed for what we know is coming already, not just how do we survive in this place. So uprooting from California and going somewhere else to continue business as usual ain't gonna last you long, I'm afraid. Now, I've been on this journey for 15 years with multiple other people. And so to me, the highest objective of something like OGM is to share the information about the crises, the diagnoses, the responses, and to find ways of how do we bring people together around better recognized rules of engagement, better recognized rules of responsibility, the meta rules for how we co-define the rules and the leadership required to actually live in real communities, in real places, in times of real stress and not just shooting everybody at the border or lobbing grenades over the boundary. Um, Neil, thank you, that, that's fantastic. One tiny thing before I pass to Jay, um, Long ago, I had a conversation with Alex Betts, who runs a really important refugee uh, organization. I can look, he's in my brain. <clears throat> and I was trying to figure out, why don't we treat refugees as first-class global citizens? Um, we can give them a digital ID. We can give them first-rate digital tools with a tablet and some Wi-Fi. <clears throat> they can be full peers uh, with video, with what, what, what have you. And these things are simple and cheap to set up pretty much anywhere on earth. Instead, what we have is refugees who often in camps are not allowed to work, have no citizen status, have no this, have no that. Like, like, so, so we're gonna have a whole lot more refugees as you, as you started with, which is, which is bleak and real, uh, very realistic, I think. There's just gonna be a lot of people moving around, not against, you know, against their will, <clears throat> not, not because they want to. Um, how do we make that life much more bearable in some way? And how do we attach to their person more value, more capacity, more assets, more whatever, so that they can build as they have to move, for example. And just a very quick follow-up. Yeah. Hurricane Katrina, there were 150 to 250,000 internal climate change refugees in the United States, right? So they've moved to somewhere else. They don't understand. They've gone there with the existing tools to try and live in existing economies, right? A project I was involved with looking at the literally the relocation of the entire nation of Tuvalu, the islands in the mid Pacific with 11,000 people. They will go underwater. They're going underwater now. 
they've got too many people because they've taken a market-based economy based on missionary zeal. Um, and so what would happen if they, if they moved the entire population to Australia, which is one of the biggest generators of greenhouse gas emissions, right? So the assumption is we can't let these people in because they're bringing a worse model. What if they brought a better model, right? What if they brought a better model of how to live together, how to use circular economy, how to live within the carrying capacity? So to me, these are system design opportunities and system design necessities. And as I say, not everybody's gonna get through, so we need multiple models. So a systems design laboratory or alliance is so critical to this and it has to be tailored for place and not just current uh, place, but future place, anticipating what's coming to these places. Ties into classes discussions about soil regeneration and regenerative farming. You know, these models alone aren't going to work unless we seriously do whole systems design, which includes governance. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Jay? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that um, I, I thank you. That's a beautiful um, assessment, Neil. I, I, just, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think that the territories we're talking about and the acts is not necessarily something for every single person, um, but there is a trend that, um, we're, that I, we're seeing and get, it's gonna increase. And, there, and, it's, and it's a certain segment of the population that isn't necessarily entirely out of resources. So that's a segment but maybe that can be leveraged to um, anchor certain places to, you know, like I think about the mission system, right? One, one day's walk, except the opposite approach, right? It's not the place where you actually enslave the indigenous people. It's actually when you, a place where you can return to becoming um, an indigenous person over the course of a great period of time. And so um, what I, I just wanted to just add this little bit that what I'm referencing is in semi-nomadic is not like, oh, we're here now and we're there now. It's a little bit more like what Jerry was talking about is if you're three places over the course of a year, you know, we left here because the smoke was intense for us and we were gonna go see my kids' grandparents, but we had friends who live on the land that came to stay here. And so there is some kind of model which can be anchored in place that hip camp is a little seed of. That's all I'm saying is that there's a potential there. And the idea of hip camp plus climate refugees has probably occurred to somebody, but is really super interesting. Like what, what, what does that look like as we start to flex how we use the land and how we share the land and what we expect of somebody staying on the land and how we tend it. And, and along with sort of uh, uh, indigenous populations that migrated a lot, they would sprinkle a whole bunch of seeds somewhere and then come back next season when they had sprouted. And that was, their, that was some of their food and it was also food for some of the prey that they were going to catch. And they would show up at the river when they knew the fish were about to run. And they would close the weir, uh, wait for the fish to fill the weir, pull the fish out, dry them out, carry them with. I mean, they, they, they understood the rhythms of the land and of nature on the land. And we've lost most of those connections in different places, or we've managed to dam up the river so that there's no you know, fish running in them or whatever. We've, we've managed to cock this up quite, uh, quite deeply. Um, we're getting 10 minutes to the end of our call. Uh, any closing thoughts about where we are and, and uh, how to deal with it. I'd just like to say, Jerry, that, that I thought the Google Docs approach to framing that we used the other day was so powerful that perhaps we should attempt some other discrete task things in the same framework. Uh, and I don't mean tasks like what we're going to do tomorrow, but I mean tasks like we need to frame X that would move us to proposing Y, that kind of thing because I think it's a way to come to some group consensus, you know, at least within a subset of people, if not the entire scope of people, on opportunities for alignment and action. Do you sort of mean, a, for example, in a very overly simplistic way, a Google Doc for each project we think we're doing so that people can share thoughts and build up what to do? Is that, is that a, a reasonable approach? Yeah, I think I would start with a little, you know, sort of what are the buckets before I start with the individual products. Project. And, and but, we do have discourse, which we're not using in this way, which isn't Google Docs. Pete, go ahead. Um, I, a quick shout out. I think Judy's onto something and, and uh, uh, Access Workshops looks really good for that kind of stuff. FYI. Access work. Uh, okay. Um, cool. And there's a sort of a bunch of modifications of Zoom. Uh, a couple of us are familiar with Lucas Chaffee's Kiko and Kiko chat, which, it, which wraps around Zoom and Google Docs and Miro. Uh, 
and one of the features Kiko offers, which Zoom doesn't offer, is, is uh, from open space, the ability for people to move themselves between breakout rooms, uh, which is hard in, uh, in regular mm -hmm. Zoom. But that's, that's mm -hmm. a one particular feature. feature. And, and uh, Pete, I'm not familiar enough with Access, so I need to go figure out uh, what they're up to. Uh, Julian. Part of, part of what I'm thinking is that, I don't, I don't mean to interrupt, Trey, but I think there's energy here that we can marshal outside of the attempts to be collectively gathered in a single location. And so the asynchronous participation <clears throat> and inserting information into the flow, even though we're doing it at a different time than the other group, some people see it later and so on. I think that would really help us coalesce our vision and begin to identify things that we can test as a pilot in our own situation or i don't know maybe i'm not making sense but you're making sense and what you're, what you're asking is a very ogm -y question it's like <clears throat> what is the what is the infrastructure the technical infrastructure for our shared memory about these things we'd like to do together and it's it's what scott talked about at the beginning of the call about maybe we need a a directory or a hub and spoke model or uh, other kinds of things right it's 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 all of these things uh, julian go ahead I, I really like judy's idea and following up on a conversation let's see I forgot who it was earlier about to, why, why does peace important to you? I think some of the initial contributions could be from everybody as to why OGM is important. Thank you. Um, other thoughts, Scott? Uh, quick thought, Jerry, that was in our previous call. So I'll quick highlight it. Um, the idea here was that what does this look like from a tangible software standpoint? And the thought I, I presented was a hub and spoke in the sense that the spokes are all the different pieces of software we have now, have in the future. And my, uh, I, I've always tried to corral those, but only in my head. And it all got better when I started using the brain and it doesn't have to be the brain, it can be anything, as my central repository. So this is the place I go to first. And if I have a doc over here, I attach it to this place attach, 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 so that I always go to this one place and it only needs to be able to help me collect and connect. It doesn't need to be able to do everything. It's just very simple, easy way to do that. And so that was the hub and spoke context that we were talking about. Um, and also one, one, one of the most important insights from 22 years of using the brain for me is this idea of a curated memory that's ongoing. And, and, I, and I have a video I'll, I'll share here about, I think I'm having a really unique experience uh, in, with this brain thing because almost nobody has uh, a tool that allows them to keep an ongoing memory uh, like this and to share it out. No, but never mind the sharing out part, just to have something reliable for yourself where all of the different moving parts can be found and are, are stitched together, woven together into a larger context. And so as we were, the, the very question Judy was asking a little while ago about how do we remember this and, and all that is, is kind of that. It's like, what does that look like for a group and how does it suit different people's best ways of working and representation? So we're kind of struggling to make the discourse forums work, but the discourse forums we could use in this way as well. Like there, there's nothing stopping us from do that. In fact, uh, threads or posts can be wiki-like, which is, which I don't fully understand yet. Sorry, sorry, Pete, but, um, but, Part of it is how do we evolve this, this infrastructure together uh, to make it actually do our bidding and to be really powerful and shareable outside and, and all of that. Uh, Judy, I think you'd raise your hand, yeah. Well, I'm just, I see the brain as predominantly a knowledge preservation content focus and perhaps I'm viewing it incorrectly and there's a way to extract a new hub that's all of the action focuses because that's part of what I'm interested in is how do we align shared action to have more impact? Mm -hmm. And it's sort of the downhill mm -hmm. of a realization that we share a value and that we want to work toward furthering that value or helping a certain group of people or whatever. But I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with how to frame the coalescence of action in terms of who's already doing it, I should talk to them, who else should I invite in because they're aligned here? How can we test it in Minnesota? Um, can we test it in Minnesota and Brussels at the same time so we have comparison points? 
Um, it's a form of evolution of social action in a sense. Um, right. And I'm saying this poorly, I think, but anyway. You're making sense to me. Um, and I'll just relate that one of the ways I use the brain, so I use the brain in, in ways that are probably, that probably cover four or five different kinds of tools. Because one of, one of the, the tools is like, it's a mind map of, of industry structures and products and services and people and all that. Another way is when I, when I get a new project, I start a, a thought in my brain. I usually mark it private unless the project is completely open like this is. Um, and then I connect to it. A lot of the people who are essential to the project, a lot of the working documents are there. So when I need to go figure out, oh, where was the Miro board for this particular thing? I go to my brain, as Scott was describing, and it's right there. And I just follow that link out. And, and so, so I, I have little collections of documents that are related to ongoing things. So I'm using it not as a planning tool or as a getting or as a GTD tool, which other people use the brain for, or as a to-do list, <clears throat> but um, I use it as the collection of things and people that matter to a particular issue. And then that project is also connected up into its general theme. So if this project is about collaboration or, or uh, collective intelligence or whatever else, then it'll be connected to that, which then leads you to all the other things related. And, and so I'm using it uh, very much in, in that way, which for me personally, is really fruitful, has been very satisfying and works quite well. And I'm, I'm not that organized in other parts of my life, but that, that's worked really well. Uh, Neil, uh, you had your hand up. Yeah, just a quick one. Um, Judy and I had a conversation earlier in the week and uh, riffing off Scott's uh, hub and spoke, one of the examples we used was octopus. Um, the octopus is an intelligent being with a central brain, huge capacity for, uh, for seeing, changing, morphing, um, but it has eight tentacles, all of which have their own brains and can feel in multiple different directions simultaneously, sensing the environment and changing shape, literally morphing to, to suit what's required. And so it's just riffing on that as a more ecological slash living process of evolving in the context into which it's being placed. So I don't see it just as a static repository. I see it as a static repository being refined through multiple sensory organs of which Jerry is probably the biggest. Um, if that's not a rude thing to say, um, you are, you are our skin, Jerry. Um, the, um, so this capacity for finding, retrieving, collecting, bringing, and then weaving is, is something that octopuses do, right? They can also get through narrow gaps. And so I think there's some really uh, powerful analogies here. If we use living systems rather than uh, wheels, like the one I had to get replaced on my bike today, um, because spokes break. <laughs> I was lucky. <laughs> yeah, thanks. That's, that's a that's a difficult failure. That hurts. Um, yes, and and kind of like Wikipedia, a few people do some a bunch of curation, and then millions and millions and millions of people enjoy the fruits of their labor. Um, everybody doesn't have to be doing the active weaving and curating. It would be enough if we had a bunch of people, a small group of people from very different perspectives doing the weaving and curating. And if the rest of us were able to tap into that, reuse it and enhance it in whatever way worked for us and uh, appropriate it, link into it, improve it, wh whatever. But just th that's kind of part of the vision here is, is not, that, not that everybody becomes a brain user or a Kumu user or a whatever, but rather that we have a simple enough infrastructure where everybody can use it like we use Wikipedia and then en enrich it, feed it back at, because it's a commons. Uh, and that that is simple enough that that we're sort of not overwhelming everybody, but that our world there is, is a little simpler to, to be in. Neil. So, so one, one quick practical thing on that. If you're going to have a commons, you're going to have to have commons managers or nurturers or maintainers. And so one of the elements here is question mark, how much would it cost to actually employ people to do that? Or is this all for love, not money? Because if that's a critical function of growing the intelligence and the capacity of the brain, then the commons process needs to have a, an economic mechanism for feeding the benefits from those, or sorry, some of the, the benefits from those who are gaining benefit from it back into it. Wikipedia struggles on occasions because it relies on volunteer labor and it needs you know, money and energy to run, et cetera, et cetera. You guys would know more about that than me. So what are the stocks? What are the flows? And how do we get flows going which are sustainable? because that's going to be the key. Once it becomes seen as a learning organism capable of doing things better than an encyclopedia, right? And because people are behind the scenes going, yes, I'll just help you with your inquiry. You've got an organismal 
if that's not the wrong word, ecosystemic approach to how do we bring the benefits of this to the world, not just here's a stock of, of knowledge and if you want to access it, here's the fee. Yep. Right. Yeah, thank you. Doug? Yeah, here's something to try and imagine. How does a commons cope with migrants? Which commons do you mean? The information commons doesn't care. No, no, a, a land uh, food living commons. Yeah, yeah, that's a huge issue. That's a giant issue coming, coming, whopping us over the head now. I mean, well, it just, seems to me sorry. that private property prevents migration, but migration is one of the standard ways that keep species, including humans, have coped with change. Also, in, your, in England and a bunch of European countries, there are rights of access to private property. <clears throat> so you're allowed to camp on somebody's land for, for three days, I believe, as long as you leave it as it was, and they cannot move you from it. So I, I have a funny feeling that either those laws are going to get changed to the worse, or that's going to be happening a whole bunch more. Uh, and we're going to see the results of the frictions that that kicks up, uh, Klaus, and then we're going to take us out of the call. Yeah, the disturbing thing really is that there is absolutely no leadership focused on these issues. In fact, everybody is sticking in, uh, defending their own territory, closing down instead of developing joint solutions. When you look at the existing refugee crisis in the Middle East and I mean, in, in, the, in the Mediterranean region there, um, that's no solution. I mean, there are millions of people already herded into camps with absolutely no way out and no way to go. And, and in the meantime, the food supply is running out you now. And so we already have food shortages emerging. So the, the, if there's anything that we can do to initiate a thought process of engaging the future, which is already inevitable, I mean, that, I think that would be hugely helpful. So a very cynical scenario you just reminded me of that I read some months ago was that the autocratic populist countries that are shutting down their barriers and bear, you know, uh, banning foreigners from, from doing whatever and really, really doing what you just described are not climate skeptics or deniers. They're in fact fully aware of the, the disaster scenarios we're moving toward. And what they're doing is building up the defensive barriers so that they can protect their, their walls and keep their fortunes and, do, you know, and, and, and defend themselves against climate refugees that may be coming. And I hate to think that that's true, but it seems plausible. So, and, and I don't want to end the call on that. I need to know something about puppies and dolphins or, or something before we, before we go out. Uh, Mark. Yeah, um, I met uh, recently, um, where is he from? Down, Senegal. Um, a, a man from Senegal who migrated to Spain. He wanted to go to France, but then he met his, uh, his better half in Spain and lives now in Valencia. And he's been hired by the city of Valencia to build uh, a model where uh, um, immigrants are actually engaged into the future, brought in to think about the future of the city itself. And he's really, you know, he's, he's, he's a bit at the beginning of it. And, and I'm wondering if everything that I've heard here is, could really benefit his own, you know, thinking path. So I don't know if, if there would be something to do there. I mean, he's really brilliant. Um, is, there, is there a way that, uh, that the group can can work on something like this? Uh, it's possible. We probably need to link arms with somebody who's in the middle of doing something like that, like the, like the fellow you talked to, mm -hmm. um, and figure out how we might be helpful to it. Um, anyone else have a thought? On a positive note, I watched, probably many of you have seen it, a film on octopi uh, called Octopus My Teacher about a guy who spends an entire year visiting one octopus uh, and developing a relationship with it. It's an amazing film. Octopus, my teacher. That's actually my octopus teacher. Um, and it's, 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 and, and that, that fellow's family has to be the most patient humans on earth because 
<clears throat> and he does something really dangerous. He is free, to, you know, no tank, no anything. He's just holding his breath and going down and hanging out with the same octopus for a year. It's insane. It's beautiful. Um, and really, well, I'd like impressively shot. He's a very incredibly good photographer uh, for doing all this. And he had, he, there were other people who were diving with him. There's, a, there's also some videos you can watch of the making of and the relationships and the producers and the woman he met who sort of uh, fueled, fueled the whole thing. It's really interesting. Um, any last words before we wrap this call? Neil, please. Just, just a positive comment. There is a latent desire for transformative change everywhere I go. And it's currently prevented by people that think they're doing it, right? And so this is the future of markets. This is the future of insurance. This is the future of our investment. This is the redirected investment. This is everything, right? At the moment, there is no market model because it doesn't pay in the current paradigm. We have to find a way to catch the current paradigm as it falls off its plateau of complacency. Right? It's sitting here thinking it's resilient and it's collapsing. So designing into the future has to say, how do we catch those that are falling off, whether it's the refugees, the migrants or others. But everywhere I go, there is a latent desire for transformative change. So change agents that can bring this sort of systemic understanding, systemic knowledge, mm. you know, then there's ways forward. I think if I heard uh, Mark's question correctly, it was around sustainable cities. Um, um, you know, the design requirements for this need to find the willing communities that are ready to have it applied. Coming back to Judy's point, where are the places where the same model could be applied globally because the climate's the same or going to be the same? You know, where are the models that exist now that could be transferred to somewhere that's going to be a desert in 50 years' time? Right. And how do we get that planning? Because that's the redirection of capital investment globally. And unless somebody can get that thinking happening, nothing's going to change because it'll be the boiling frog syndrome. So I think we're on the cusp. Uh, and I really think we've got some of the tools. And I'm very keen to work with anybody that can see how to land this stuff, but also how to hold the big picture concepts. And it's the vertical threads through and the vertical alignment and coherence through different levels of doing through to thinking, conceptualizing, which is required. And that's so lacking, that capacity to hold the thread, not just to do the piece. And I think um, online global mind can do that. And just to riff on what you said and then take us out of the call, um, <clears throat> my own, my own, some of my images around what you just said are of the value of storytelling here. That part of what the problem is, is that anybody who's in a, a, a crisis basically sees that there's this like raging river next to them. And somebody's taught, somebody's making some word sounds about how life is better on the other side of the river, but they can't picture themselves crossing that river. They can't even imagine putting a toe into the river. And so the stories we can tell are like stones in the river, like solid footholds across that, that, that torrent so that they can find their way to a different way of being, a different way of living, whatever else it might be. And lots of stories told around real life situations and Kurichiba did this thing with kids that turned them into the greenest city. That's kind of cool. We're not really good, but there's a piece of that story we'd like to borrow, appropriate, adapt and implement locally. And once that happens over and over and over and over and over, and then if smart people can be of service, you know, experts on tap, not on top kind of thing, um, then I think we get somewhere really quickly because people can retake their sense of agency. They can start redesigning, rebuilding within these nested crises that are that are impinging all the time. But but so so one of my one of the mental images that works really well for me is how do we put stones in that river so that people can say, oh, other humans have crossed the river before and they're doing great. And and suddenly I have a much clearer vision of what life is like over there, and I'm willing to take those steps. <clears throat> and also. How do we put those steps closer to shore? How do we make the stones larger, right? Uh, metaphorically, but, but if the stone is slippery and out in the middle, I'm not gonna try that leap. But if I only have to change my behavior a little bit to test it and taste it, and I like it, and then I can go to the next step, we're, we're, then we're moving. Uh, so you, you kind of have to, to, to make that somehow uh, work. Um, thank you all for another awesome conversation. I really appreciate these very deeply. Um, Namaste, y'all. Namaste right here for a while. And uh, you'll hear more about the workshop shortly. And uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, everybody. Wonderful. Bye, everyone.
Take care. Take care. Bye.